This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barbara Foff of Perryville, Missouri. Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter 18. She hurried to the first meeting of the play reading committee. Her jungle romance had faded, but she retained a religious fervor a surge of half-formed thoughts about the creation of beauty by suggestion a dunsany play would be too difficult for the gopher prairie association she would let them compromise on shaw on androcles and the lion which had just been published the committee was composed of carol vita sherwood guy pollock ramey witherspoon and juanita haydock they were exalted by the picture of themselves as being simultaneously business-like and artistic they were entertained by vita in the parlor of mrs alicia gurry's boarding-house with its steel engravings of grant at apotomax its basket of stereoscopic views and a mysterious stain on the greedy carpet vita was an advocate of culture buying and efficiency systems she hinted that they ought to have as at the committee meetings of the thanatopus a regular order of business and the reading of the minutes but as there were no minutes to read and as no one knew exactly what was the regular order of business of being literary they had to give up efficiency carol as chairman said politely have you any ideas about what play we better give first she waited for them to look abashed and vacant so that she might suggest androcles guy pollock answered with disconcerting readiness i'll tell you so if we're going to try something artistic and not simply fool around i believe we ought to give something classic how about the school for scoundrel why don't you think that's been done a good deal yes perhaps it has carol was ready to say how about bernard shaw when he treacherously went on how would it be then to give a greek drama say uh, oedipus tyrannus why i don't believe vita sherwood intruded i'm sure that would be too hard for us now i've brought something that i think would be awfully jolly she held out and carol incredulously took a thin gray pamphlet entitled magentry's mother-in-law it was a sort of farce which is advertised in the school entertainment catalogue as rip-roaring knockout five male three female time two hours interior set popular with churches and all high-class occasions carol glanced from the scabrous object to vita and realized that she was not joking but this this is why it's just a why vita i thought you appreciated well appreciated art vita snorted oh art oh yes i do like art it's very nice but after all what does it matter what kind of play we give as long as we get the association started the thing that matters is something that none of you have spoken of that is what are we going to do with the money if we make any i think it would be awfully nice if we presented the high school with a full set of stoddard's travel lectures carol moaned oh vita dear do forgive me but this farce now what i'd like us to give is something distinguished say uh, shaw's androcles have any of you read that yes good play said guy pollock then ramey witherspoon astoundingly spoke up so have i i read through all the plays in the public library so's to be ready for this meeting and uh, but i don't believe you grasp the irreligious ideas of androcles mrs kennicott i guess the feminine mind is too innocent to understand these immoral writers i'm sure i don't want to criticize bernard shaw i understand he is very popular with the highbrows in minneapolis but just the same as far as i can make out he is downright improper the things he says well it would be very risky for our young folks to see it seems to me that a play that doesn't have a a nice taste in the mouth and that hasn't any message is nothing but nothing but well whatever it may be it is an art so now i found a play that is clean and there are some awfully funny scenes in it too i laughed out loud reading it it's called his mother's heart and it's about a young man in college 
who gets in with a lot of free thinkers and boothers and everything, but in the end, his mother's influence. Juanita Haydock broke in with a derisive, Oh, rats, Ramey, can the mother's influence. I say, let's give something with some class to it. I bet we could get the rights to The Girl from Kankakee. That's a real show. It ran for 11 months in New York. That would be a lot of fun, if it wouldn't cost too much, reflected Vita. Carol's was the only vote cast against The Girl from Kankakee. Part 2. She disliked The Girl from Kankakee even more than she had expected. It narrated the success of a farm lassie in clearing her brother of a charge of forgery. Then she became secretary to a New York millionaire and social counselor to his wife. And, after well-conceived speech on the discomfort of having money, she married his son. There was also a humorous office boy. Carol discerned that both Juanita Haydock and Ella Stowbody wanted the lead. She let Juanita have it. Juanita kissed her, and in the exuberant manner of a new star presented to the executive committee her theory. What we want in a play is humor and pep. That's where the American playwrights put it all over these darn old European glooms. As selected by Carol and confirmed by the committee, the persons of the play were John Grimm, a millionaire, played by Guy Pollock, his wife, played by Miss Vita Sherwood, his son, played by Dr. Harvey Dillon, his business rival, played by Raymond T. Witherspoon, friend of Mrs. Grimm, played by Miss Ella Stowbody, the girl from Kankakee, played by Miss Harold C. Haydock, her brother, played by Dr. Terence Gould, her mother, played by Mrs. David Dyer stenographer played by miss rita simmons office boy played by miss myrtle cass maid in the grimm's home played by miss w p kennicott direction of mrs kennicott among the minor lamentations was maud dyer's well of course i suppose i do look old enough to be juanita's mother even if juanita is eight months older than i am but I don't know as I care to have everybody noticing it. And Carol pleaded, Oh, my dear, you two look exactly the same age. I chose you because you have such a darling complexion. And you know, with powder and a white wig, anybody looks twice her age. And I want the mother to be sweet, no matter who else is. Ella Stowbody, the professional, perceiving that it was a conspiracy of jealousy that she had been given such a small part, alternated between lofty amusement and Christian patience. Carol hinted that the play would be improved by cutting, but as every actor except Vita and Guy and herself wailed at the loss of a single line, she was defeated. She told herself that, after all, a great deal could be done with direction and settings. Sam Clark had boastfully written about the dramatic association to his schoolmate, Percy Bresnahan president of the Velvet Motor Company of Boston. Bresnahan sent a check for a hundred dollars. Sam added twenty-five and brought the fund to Carol, fondly crying, There, that'll give you a start for putting things across well. She rented the second floor of the city hall for two months. All through the spring, the association thrilled to its own talents in that dismal room. They cleared out the bunting, ballot boxes, handbills, legless chairs. They attacked the stage. It was a simple-minded stage. It was raised above the floor, and it did have a movable curtain, painted with the advertisements of a druggist, dead these ten years. But otherwise, it might not have been recognized as a stage. There were two dressing rooms, one for men, one for women, on either side. The dressing room doors were also the stage entrances, opening from the house and many citizens of gopher prairie had for his first glimpse of romance the bare shoulders of the leading woman there were three sets of scenery a woodland a poor interior and a rich interior the last also useful for a railway station offices and as a background for the swedish quartet from chicago there were three graduations of lighting full on half on and entirely off this was the only theater in gopher prairie it was known as the opera house once strolling companies had used it for performances of the two orphans and nelly the beautiful cloak model and othello with specialties between acts but now 
the motion pictures had ousted the gypsy drama carol intended to be furiously modern in constructing the office set the drawing-room for mr grimm the humble home near kankakee it was the first time that any one in gopher prairie had been so revolutionary as to use enclosed scenes with continuous side walls the rooms in the opera house sets had separate wing pieces for sides which simplified dramaturgy as the villain could always get out of the hero's way by walking out through the wall the inhabitants of the humble home were supposed to be amiable and intelligent carol planned for them a simple set with warm color she could see the beginning of the play all dark save the high settles and the solid wooden table between them which were to be illuminated by rays from off stage the high light was a polished copper pot filled with primroses less clearly she sketched the grimm's drawing-room as a series of cool high white arches as to how she was to produce these effects she had no notion she discovered that despite the enthusiastic young writer the drama was not half so native and close to the soil as motor cars and telephones she discovered that simple art requires sophisticated training she discovered that to produce one perfect stage picture would be as difficult as to turn all gopher prairie into a georgian garden she read all she could find regarding staging she bought paint and light wood she borrowed furniture and drapes unscrupulously she made kennicott turn carpenter she collided with problem of lighting against the protest of kennicott and vita she mortgaged the association by sending to minneapolis for baby spotlight a strip light a dimming device and blue and amber bulbs and with the gloating rapture of a born painter first turn loose the monk's color she spent absorbed evenings in grouping dimming paintings with lights only kennicott guy and vita helped her they speculated as to how flats could be lashed together to form a wall they hung crocus yellow curtains at the window they blackened sheet iron stove they put on aprons and swept the rest of the association dropped into the theater every evening they were literary and superior they borrowed carol's manuals of play production and became extremely stagey in vocabulary juanita haydock rita simmons and ramey wotherspoon sat on a sawhorse watching carol try to get the right position for a picture on the wall in the first scene i don't want to hand myself anything but i believe i gave a swell performance in the first act confided juanina i wish carol wasn't so bossy though she doesn't understand clothes i want to wear oh a dandy dress i have all scarlet and i said to her when i enter wouldn't it knock their eyes out if i just stood there at the door in this straight scarlet thing but she wouldn't let me young rita agreed she's so much taken up with her old details and carpentering and everything that she can't see the picture as a whole now i thought it would be lovely if we had an office scene like the one in little but oh my because i saw that in duluth but she simply wouldn't listen at all juanita sighed i wanted to give one speech like ethel barrymore would if she was in a play like this harry and i heard her one time in minneapolis we had dandy seats in the orchestra i just know i could imitate her carol didn't pay any attention to my suggestion i don't want to criticize but i guess ethel knows more about acting than carol does so do you think carol has the right dope about using strip light behind the fireplace in the second act i told her i thought we ought to use a bunch offered ramey and i suggested it would be lovely if we used a cyclorama outside the window in the first act and what do you think she said she said yes and it would be lovely to have eleanor deuce play the lead she said and aside from the fact that it's evening in the first act you're a great technician she said i must say i think she was pretty sarcastic i've been reading up and i know you could build a cyclorama even if she didn't want to run everything yes and another thing i think the entrance in the first act ought to be l u e not l three e from juanita and why does she just use plain white tormentors what's a tormentor blurted rita simmons the savants stared at her ignorance part three carol did not resent their criticisms she didn't very much resent their sudden knowledge so long as they let her make pictures 
it was at rehearsal that quarrels broke no one understood that rehearsals were a real engagement as bridge games or socials at the episcopal church they gaily came in a half hour late or they came in ten minutes early and they were so hurt that they whispered about resigning when carol protested they telephoned i don't think i'd better come out afraid of the dampness might start my toothache or can't make it tonight dave wants me to sit in on a poker game when after a month of labor as many as nine elevenths of the cast were often present at rehearsal when most of them had learned their parts and some of them spoke like human beings carol had a new shock in the realization that guy pollock and herself were very bad actors and that ramey witherspoon was a surprisingly good one for all her visions she could not control her voice and she was bored by the fiftieth repetition of her few lines as maid guy pulled his soft mustache looked self-conscious and turned mr grimp into a limp dummy but ramey as villain had no repressions the tilt of his head was full of character his draw was admirably vicious there was an evening when carol hoped she was going to make a play a rehearsal during which guy stopped looking abashed from that evening the play declined they were weary we know our parts well enough what's the use of getting sick of them they complained they began to skylark to play with the sacred lights to giggle when carol was trying to make the sentimental myrtle cast into the humorous office boy to act everything but the girl from kankakee after loafing through his pauper part dr terry gould had great applause for his burlesque of hamlet when ramey lost his simple faith and tried to show that he could do vaudeville shuffle carol turned on the company see here i want this nonsense to stop we've simply got to get down to work juanita haydock led the mutiny look here carol don't be so bossy after all we're doing this play principally for the fun of it and if we are having fun out of a lot of monkey shines why then yes feebly you said one time folks in g p didn't get enough fun out of life and now we are having a circus and you want to stop us carol answered slowly i wonder if i can explain what i mean it's the difference between looking at a comic page and looking at a manet i want fun out of this of course only i don't think it would be less fun but more to produce as perfect a play as we can she was curiously exalted her voice was strained she stared not at the company but at the grotesque scrawled on the back of the wing pieces by forgotten stage hands i wonder if you can understand the fun of making a beautiful thing the pride and the satisfaction of it and the holiness the company glanced doubtfully at one another in gopher prairie it is not good form to be holy except at church between ten thirty and twelve on sunday but if we want to do it we've got to work we must have self-discipline they were at once amused and embarrassed they didn't want to affront this mad woman they backed off and tried to rehearse carol did not hear juanita in front protesting to maud dyer if she calls it fun and holiness to sweat over her darned old play well i don't part four carol attended the only professional play which came to gopher prairie that spring it was a tent show presenting snappy new dramas under canvas the hard-working actors doubled in brass and took tickets and between acts sang out about the moon in june and sold dr wintergreen's surefire tonic for ills of the heart lungs kidneys and bowels they presented sunbonnet nell a dramatic comedy of the ozarks with j witherby boothby ringing out the soul by his resonant ya ain't done right by ma little gal mr city man but you're a gonna find that back in these year hills there's honest folks 
and good shot the audience on planks beneath the patched tent admired mr boothby's beard and long rifle stamped their feet in the dust at the spectacle of his heroism shouted when the comedian aped the city lady's use of a lorgon by looking through a doughnut stuck on a fork wept visibly over mr boothby's little gal nell who was also mr boothby's legal wife pearl and when the curtain went down listened respectfully to mr boothby's lecture on dr wintergreen's tonic as a cure for tapeworms when he illustrated by horrible palette objects curled in bottles of yellowing alcohol carol shook her head juanita is right i am a fool holiness of drama bernard shaw the only trouble with the girl from kankakee is that it's too subtle for gopher prairie she sought faith in spacious banal phrases taken from books the instinctive nobility of simple souls need only the opportunity to appreciate fine things and sturdy exponents of democracy but these optimists did not sound so loud as the laughter of the audience at the funny man's lines yes by hecklem i'm a smart fella she wanted to give up the play the dramatic association the town as she came out of the tent and walked with kennicott down the dusty spring street she peered at this straggling wooden village and felt that she could not possibly stay here through all of tomorrow it was miles bjornstam who gave her strength he and the fact that every seat for the girl from kankakee had been sold bjornstam was keeping company with b every night he was sitting on the back steps once when carol appeared he grumbled hope you're giving this burg one good show if you don't reckon nobody ever will part five it was the great night it was the night of the play the two dressing rooms were swirling with actors panting twitchy pale del snaffin the barber who was much of a professional as ella having once gone on in a mob scene at a stock company performing in minneapolis was making them up and showing his scorn for amateurs stand still for the love of mike how do you expect me to get your eyelids dark if you keep a wigglin the actors were beseeching hey dell put some red in my nostrils you put some in rita's jeez you didn't hardly do anything for my face they were enormously theatric they examined dell's makeup box they sniffed the scent of the grease paint every minute they ran out to peep through the hole in the curtain they came back to inspect their wigs and costumes they read on the whitewashed walls of the dressing room the pencil inscriptions floral flanders comedy company and this is a bum theater and felt that they were companions of these vanished troopers carol smart in maid's uniform coaxed the temporary stage hands to finish setting the first act wailed at kennicott the electrician now for heaven's sakes remember to change in cue for the ambers in act two slipped out to ask dave dyer the ticket taker if he could get some more chairs warned the frightened myrtle cast to be sure to upset the wastebasket when john grimm called here are you ready del snaffin's orchestra of piano violin and cornet began to tune up and every one behind the magic line of pro scenic arch was frightened into paralysis carol wavered to the hole in the curtain there were so many people out there staring so hard in the second row she saw miles bjornstam not with b but alone he really wanted to see the play it was a good omen who could tell perhaps this evening would convert gopher prairie to a conscientious beauty she darted into the women's dressing room roused maud dyer from her fainting panic rushed her to the wings and ordered the curtain up it rose doubtfully it staggered and trembled but it did get up without catching this time then she realized that kennicott had forgotten to turn off the house lights someone out front was giggling she galloped round to the left wing herself pulled the switch looked so furiously at kennicott that he quaked and fled back miss dyer was creeping out on a half darkened stage the play begun and with that instant carol realized that it was a bad play abominably acted encouraging them with lying smiles she watched her work go to pieces the setting seemed flimsy the lighting commonplace she watched guy pollock stammer and twist his mustache when he should have been bullying the magnate vita sherwin as grimm's timid wife 
chattered at the audience as though they were her class in high school english juanita in the leading role defied mr grimm as though they were repeating a list of things she had to buy at the grocery this morning ella stowbody remarked i'd like a cup of tea as though she were reciting curfew shall not ring to-night and dr ghoul making love to rita simmons squeaked my my you are a wonderful girl myrtle cass as the office boy was so much pleased by the applause of her relatives then so much agitated by the remarks of cy bogart in the back row in reference to her wearing trousers that she could hardly be got off the stage only ramey was so unsociable as to devote himself entirely to acting that she was right in her opinion of the play carol was certain when miles bjornstam went out after the first act and did not come back part six between the second and third act she called the company together and supplicated i want to know something before we've had a chance to separate whether we're doing well or badly tonight it is a beginning but we will take it as merely a beginning how many of you will pledge yourself to start with me right away tomorrow and plan for another play to be given in september they stared at her they nodded at juanita's protest i think one's enough for a while it's going elegant tonight but another play seems to me it'll be time enough to talk about it next fall carol i hope you don't mean to hint and suggest we're not doing fine tonight i'm sure the applause shows the audience think it's just dandy then carol knew how completely she had failed as the audience seeped out she heard b j gooderling the banker say to howard lynn the grocer well i think the folks did splendid just as good as professionals but i don't care much for these plays what i like is a good movie with auto accidents and hold-ups and some get to it not all this talky talk then carol knew how certain she was to fail again she wearily did not blame them company nor audience herself she blamed for trying to carve intaglios into good wholesome jack pine it's the worst defeat of them all i'm beaten by main street i must go on but i can't she was not vastly encouraged by gopher prairie dauntless it would be impossible to distinguish among the actors when all of them gave such fine accounts of themselves in difficult roles of this well-known new york stage play guy pollock as the old millionaire could not have been better for his fine impersonation of the guff old millionaire miss harry haydock as the young lady from the west who so easily showed the new york four flushers where they got off was a vision of loveliness with fine stage presence miss vita sherwood the ever popular teacher in our high school pleased as mrs grimm dr gould was well suited in the role of young lover girls you better look out remember the doc is a bachelor the local four hundred also reported that he is a great hand at shaking the light fantastic tootsies in the dance as the stenographer rita simmons was pretty as a picture and miss ella stowbody's long and intensive study of the drama and kindred arts in eastern schools was seen in the finest finish of her part to no one is greater credit to be given than to mrs will kennicott on whose capable shoulders fell the burden of directing so kindly carol mused so well meant so neighborly and so confoundedly untrue is it really my failure or theirs she sought to be sensible she elaborately explained to herself it was hysterical to condemn gopher prairie because it did not foam over drama its justification was in its service as a market town for farmers how bravely and generously did it work forwarding the bread to the world feeding and healing the farmers then on the corner below her husband's office she heard a farmer hold forth sure course i was beaten the shipper and the grocer here wouldn't pay us a decent price for our potatoes even though folks in the cities were howling for em so we say well we'll get a truck and ship em right down to minneapolis but the commission merchants there were in cahoots with the local shippers here and they said they wouldn't pay us a cent more than he would not even if they were near to the market well we found we could get a higher price in chicago but when we tried to get freight cars to ship there the railroads wouldn't let us have em even though they had cars standing empty right here in the yards there you got it good market and these towns keeping us from it 
Gus, that's the way these towns work all the time. They pay what they want for our wheat, but we pay what they want us to for their clothes. Stowbody and Dawson foreclose every mortgage they can and put it in tenant farmers. The Dauntless lies to us about the nonpartisan league. The lawyers sting us. The machinery dealers hate to carry us over bad years, and their daughters put on swell dresses and look at us if we were a bunch of hobos. Man, I'd like to burn this town, Kennicott observed. There's that old crank, Wes Brannigan, shooting off his mouth again. Gosh, but he loves to hear himself talk. They ought to run that fella out of town. Part 7 She felt old and detached through high school commencement week, which is the feat of youth in Gopher Prairie. Through bachelorette sermon, senior parade, junior entertainment, commencement address by an Iowa clergyman who asserted that he believed in the virtue of virtuousness and the procession of decoration day when the few civil war veterans followed champ perry in his rusty forged cap along the spring powdered road to the cemetery she met guy she found that she had nothing to say to him her head ached in an aimless way when kennicott rejoiced we'll have a great time this summer move down to the lake early and wear old clothes and act natural she smiled but her smile creaked in the prairie heat she trudged along unchanging ways talked about nothing to teepit people reflected that she might never escape from them she was startled to find that she was using the word escape then for three years which passed like one curt paragraph she ceased to find anything interesting save borger and stamps and her baby end of chapter eighteen